Jane McClellan is a 22-year stage 4 cancer survivor and the 2019 winner of the Lifetime Achievement Award, Amazing Women Global for Unsung Heroines, for her work educating and helping cancer patients since 2003. Jane McClellan battled two aggressive cancers with metastatic spread, and both were classified as terminal. Using her medical knowledge and researching heavily, she put together a cancer-starving formula using natural therapies, exercise, and diet. And when she developed a second cancer, myelodysplasia, the result of chemotherapy and radiation for her first cancer, she knew she only had weeks to live. With nothing to lose, she put together a unique cocktail of old drugs. To her enormous relief, joy, and surprise, her cancer just melted away. Her cocktail was more powerful than she had ever hoped. So to learn how to starve cancer without starving yourself, let's welcome Jane McClellan. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on. Your book is so timely. And there is about, I think if I counted correctly, there's 26 chapters in that book. And you yeah. cover every single thing I could have ever imagined someone going through cancer, going through the diagnosis, going through therapy, and then finally just grabbing the bull by the horns like you did and did it yourself. Uh, what was it like to be uh, diagnosed twice as terminal? Uh, a real kick in the pants. I mean, I, I thought I was doing okay. And um, to, to suddenly have it come back again, honestly, it's the worst feeling. You just feel like everything you've done so far has been a waste of time, which of course it wasn't. I'd, I'd always, you know, throughout the whole process, you keep learning and learning and learning. But when it came back again as that bone marrow cancer, I knew that uh, whatever I'd been doing up until that point had not been enough to take me through this because the thing was, it was a different type of cancer. And what I'd realized was different types of cancer behave differently and they actually feed themselves differently. So whereas one was mostly feeding by using glucose, um, the, the other one, which is myelodysplasia and, and leukemias generally, actually tend to, to feed themselves more on amino acids. So I was kind of using the wrong diet and the wrong approach and I had to kind of switch and use more things at my disposal to actually uh, try and shut it down. So it was a real learning process and I was, you know, uh, my own guinea pig, if you like, uh, and I had no idea that what I was doing was going to work. I was literally just throwing things at it and just keeping my fingers crossed. Having done research, I mean, I do have a science background. I'm a trained physiotherapist. So that was that was my background in uh, in science and in medicine. So I'd had quite a lot of um uh, ability to research some of these things up until that point but it was it was um a total uh, shock to me um the whole diagnosis of actually having cancer i was very young when i first was diagnosed i was only 30 and then it was 35 when it was stage four and then coming back as myelodysplasia you know it was a continual kick um so you know it was a process and um I, I i got there in the end and then the research since about 2015 has really come out to back and support all the methods that i use in my uh my approach of uh, thinking about it as sort of something to starve and something to uh cut back with the metabolic processes this this has really only become um accepted by certainly by the the medical research it hasn't quite made it down to the clinic yet the whole concept that uh, cancer feeds itself and is actually more of a metabolic disease than it is a genetic disease and people are still um set on the idea that it's genetic and you need genetic targets and genetic drugs we don't we also need metabolic drugs to actually affect the way that it feeds because cancer has a very different way of feeding itself to normal healthy cells and this this is one of its achilles heels yeah i don't i agree with you because i don't believe cancer is fully a genetic disease based on the fact that when i hear people well this cancer runs in my family and i'm thinking no the only thing that runs in your family is your eating habits because then <laughs> that places it as a metabolic disease not a genetic one 
And so let me ask you this because I have talked to so many cancer patients and when they get a diagnosis, the first thing they do besides going through the whole mental process of like, oh my gosh, I have this, I have cancer. They literally bow down to the oncologist and allow them to do whatever they want. They never research what their cancer is. And like you said, you had two different types of cancer. One worked off of glucose, one, one worked off amino acids. That's a whole nother interview just right there by itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah what, absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, so what can you say to those that are watching, those that are listening, if they've been diagnosed with cancer, where is their place in the, in the therapy? What do they need to do instead of just bowing wow. down to the conventional yeah. chemotherapy radiation, yeah. which is basically just throwing spaghetti to the wall? Well, it's targeting those fast dividing cells. And, and that's important. We do need to accept that they do have a role to play and they will attack those really fast dividing cells. So you can knock back the tumor, but unfortunately it doesn't get rid of the cancer stem cells, which are there at the heart of the tumor. They are slow dividing. And these are the ones that are flexible. They can change the way they feed. They can switch from glucose to glutamine, which is that amino acid, or they can use fat. They can use all, you know, they can even use ketones, which are meant to be, so, you know, the ketogenic diet is meant to be the thing. But, um, you know, we have to be more aware of uh, cancer as a very complex um, uh, thing. And you cannot just rely on one aspect of, of treatment to be working because it has these workarounds. So if you block one target, the reason we can't cure cancer at the moment is because it learns to go and use another path. And what I've done is try and break down what those pathways are. And actually, when you look at it, the metabolic pathways, there's a limited number of them. So it is actually possible to target and stop the cancer from growing by targeting the metabolic pathways. Whereas genetics, it can multi, you know, it can use so many different genetic mutations um that you're forever chasing your tail with it but these metabolic targets are actually much easier to uh, approach and shut down in in many ways and well, um well. if we look at it as sort of doing both together that's the important thing to 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 look at well let me ask you this thing. what are the three fuel sources that cancer cells require in order to survive well, a, a glucose is kind of like everybody, they have this misconception that it's, it's all sugar driven and that's all you need to do is cut out sugar. Unfortunately, I wish it was that uh, simple. You know, we'd have a lot many more people actually surviving cancer if it all it meant was just cutting out sugar. Certainly that will help a lot. A lot of cancers are very highly what's known as glycolytic. In other words, they use glucose as its primary source and they ferment it to, to fuel themselves. But glutamine is an amino acid that uh, cancer uses. But actually trying to cut that out of your diet is virtually impossible because glutamine is the most abundant amino acid in your blood plasma. So it's not a matter of actually shutting it down in the diet. It's actually shutting down the cancer's access to it because it has receptors on the cell that actually allow it to get into the cell. And you can block it. Green tea is brilliant at helping to stop glutamine get into the cancer cells. So things like that, curcumin, um, vitamin D, also very good. And then you've got um, fat. There are some cancers uh, like melanomas and prostate cancer that really, really love fat. In fact, all cancers can kind of use all three of those uh, fuel sources, but you know, they can, they can swap and change, but they have preferences. So certain cancers will prefer different uh, fuel sources. And actually, once you know that you can kind of work on the key things to cut out of your diet and then you can complement that with supplements with um and i used a cocktail of old off-label drugs these are drugs that are not used generally for cancer they are used for other indications like um, metformin which is used for diabetes i used etodilac which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory i use dipridamol which is an anti-platelet drug sort of an anticoagulant type of drug um and lovastatin, which is a statin, which would have cut down some of those um, fat pathways, the cholesterol pathway. And in fact, dipridamol works on another corresponding cholesterol pathway. If you block one, it tends to go up the other. So I kind of blocked off the two key cholesterol pathways and all cancers 
will want to create little cancer blobs on the surface of their daughter cells. So every time it divides and replicates, it does need to create cholesterol. That's one of the things it needs. So, so I kind of shut down that excess point, but I shut down a lot of the other things that cancer needs as well. But your healthy cells don't need to keep on doing this all the time. You know, they can survive a period of starvation, if you like, for uh, a considerable amount of time without really uh, affecting your whole system um, terribly much. So it's, it's actually a, a very good way to be able to target those fast, really hungry cancer cells. And the more aggressive a cancer, the hungrier it is. So so it, it does become a sort of an easier target, actually, um, just to be working on those metabolic pathways as well as the genetic side as well. Well, Jane, let me ask you this. Is there a resource, is there a database that lists all the forms of cancer and what they actually feed off of? How did you find out what your cancers were prone to, to fuel themselves? Well, it was guesswork, to be honest, mostly back in those days The the research on this has actually really only taken off properly in the last five, six years. Um, so you can now go on to PubMed, which is the published medical articles, and it's got a huge database of of um, information there. And you can type in your your cancer type, type in something like metabolomics or metabolism, and then you can kind of work out what it might be feeding on. But it, it may go into sort of quite detailed metabolic pathways. Now, uh, I, I do encourage every cancer patient to try and learn about this. It is, it is, you know, it's, there are words that will be foreign to people when they first come into this because, you know, cancer isn't just a simple process. There are things that you've got to learn like glycolysis, oxfos, mevalonate pathway, mTOR, but these these become more familiar the more you learn about it. It's like learning a foreign language. You just have to sort of educate yourself a little bit into this. And I've done a, a full online course to try and teach people how to uh, understand all this because it isn't straightforward. And I, I, I feel it's so important that cancer patients educate themselves about this because their oncologist doesn't know about this. Yeah, and actually uh, I've got a lot of doctors signing up to my course um, to learn about this because it's not something they're taught in 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 school you know medical school that it's just totally ignored because it hasn't been accepted as a hallmark of cancer and it only became an established hallmark back in 2015 which is let's face it really recent uh, even though otto Wahlberg recognized it as a hallmark of cancer back in 1926 but it's taken this long to to actually become established as a hallmark of cancer despite all the the prior research and it's just switched from metabolic it became genetic through the 60s uh, and then it never quite became a, a a factor again until really this uh this century so it's it's really um uh, it's been a, a forgotten aspect of cancer that we really need to to encourage people, particularly oncologists, to to look at and and to embrace this in order to really get the kind of um, recovery that we need from cancer patients. Because one of the most curable cancers is pediatric leukemia. And they have used something called asparaginase in their program since about 1990s. And this works on the glutamine, one of the glutamine pathways. And suddenly from about a 20% um, recovery rate, they suddenly got 90%, you know, just by adding this metabolic drug um, into the cocktail. But we don't have that with other cancers yet. You know, that's the only one and it's the most curable because they have added that metabolic drug into it. So we need to encourage doctors, oncologists and, and patients to understand this and that there are those options to, to block those metabolic pathways out there. I do strongly believe we have got every drug that we need already to, to cure most cancers, but we just need to work on the right cocktails and yeah. find out what those are. And that's, that's part of what I'm doing now is do the research to try and work out with the different cancers and of course the mutations actually mean they feed in different ways so if you have a BRAF mutation 
in your cancer, that means it tends to feed more on ketones. If you have a P53 mutation, that will mean it uses more glucose and glutamine. So there are, there are different, um, the mutations aren't just mutations to target, they are actually metabolic drivers as well that we need to understand. So it's, it's all about, um, deep down, it's the metabolism ultimately that we need to, to really get to grips with in order to, to, to shut down the whole process of cancer. Yeah. Now how, you know, there's the two cancers that I would love to see have a much higher survival rate, which of course is pancreatic cancer yeah. and glioblastoma brain cancer. And I'm sure the way that they are fueled is completely different from one another, but usually the survival rate is 1%. I don't know, tell, tell you the truth today, I don't know of anybody that even survives either one of those. Uh, and yep, most of them are do. less than a year. What now? I've seen survivors, I've seen long-term survivors of both. Um, and, you know, they, they always uh, use some sort of metabolic approach as well. So they've either changed their diet and added other things as well, but it's never ever just using the traditional approach on its own because that that doesn't uh, tend to work or you're lucky if it does. And maybe you've you've got something in your program that has just clicked or, or maybe you've caught it early enough, but most people don't catch it early enough, particularly with pancreatic and GBM. They're, they are uh, uh, dreadful, dreadful cancers to have pancreatic does feed a lot on amino acids, but actually, you know, these these more aggressive cancers tend to feed on as many fuel sources as they can get their hands on, you know. And well, pancreatic cancer. Well, let me ask you this. how can you well how can you stop treatment resistance, which is a major cause of treatment failure? I know that with chemotherapy, you're gonna end up with maybe two to three percent of the cancer cells being uh, chemotherapy resistant. Yeah, and that's because we are only targeting the fast dividing cells and we're not getting those cancer stem cells. And the key is to use a cocktail and we need to use a cocktail that will stop multi-drug resistance. And there are some drugs out there that will actually um, stop something called the P glycoprotein, which is sort of, a, it's an efflux pump that pumps out uh, drugs. So there, there are different ways to uh, to tackle this. You need a cocktail to actually make sure that you're blocking appropriate pathways so that if you block one, it doesn't learn to work around and use another pathway. So you need to block the two pathways together. At the least, you need to be blocking two. Um, and then you need to find um, some ways to stop the drugs being pumped out. Now, I actually used um, a, a supplement called berberine when I was trying to survive my cancers. And I discovered this back in 1999. And this has the effect of actually um, holding drugs in to make, so it helps to hold chemo in the cell for a bit longer. So it actually catches the cell whilst it's dividing. So, because chemo can go into your, your cells and then out and your cancer cell may not be dividing at that point. And if it misses that point where it's dividing, then it's not gonna work. So it actually holds it into the cell for that bit longer. So there, there are lots of different ways to actually encourage chemo to work better, to make you know, these drugs um, far more effective by uh, not allowing them to become resistant. And if you use a cocktail, it's all about a combination. You must use a combination with um, any cancer treatment because, because cancer stem cells and cancer generally just has this it has this ability to work its way around and uh, create create another channel to feed itself. Well, what are some of the 18 supplements that starve cancer? <laughs> okay, right. I'm not going to go through all 18, but I can certainly give you some key ones. Um, well, berberine, uh, which I just mentioned, I think is brilliant. It's like a natural form of metformin, which is this diabetic drug that... Um, can be used uh, and, and that actually blocks multiple pathways at the same time. The, the trick is to find drugs or supplements that target more than one pathway. Therefore, you're making your job much easier because you don't need such a huge cocktail. You can actually chop it down by having drugs that uh, or supplements that target many, many um, pathways at the same time. And berberine, I would say, would be my top choice because of that, because it blocks multiple metabolic pathways. Um, green tea is up there because it blocks that glutamine pathway. It also blocks angiogenesis, which is one of the growth factors that stimulates the, 
the cancer to grow new blood vessels. Um, quercetin, which you find in onions and things like that, that's quercetin as a supplement um, that will help block some of the glucose receptors. Um, niacin, which is a B vitamin, that will that will help block some of the fat pathways. Melatonin uh, is great at night. You can take that. Um, in fact, some people actually take it during the day as well. And that helps block some of that glucose fermentation process uh, that goes on. So it's really very effective at helping to shut that down, which is one of the trickiest pathways to try and, to try and stop. So that's a, a very useful um, supplement. And there's a very expensive one called fermented wheat germ extract. And that's that targets um, several pathways, really tricky uh, glycolysis, that glucose fermentation pathway as well. So that's a, that's a really a really good one to to stick in your cocktail too. Yeah, you know. Now we talked about uh, you know how oncologists really need to step up their educational knowledge game and stop playing around with the same system and going around the same mountain expecting different results. Yeah. And, exactly. you know, yeah, and many, or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, because many yeah. doctors, they, they always say, and I think it's a, a malpractice protection mechanism when they basically say, well, this is just standard protocol. Well, standard protocol may protect you, but it's doing nothing for the patient. Yeah. So how is mainstream yeah. medicine missing the mark by only treating the rapidly dividing cancer cells and ignoring the stem cells or what they would call the holy grail and growth factors? I, I think it's a lack of knowledge and education. It stems back to, you know, their medical school, but also it is that fear of litigation. You know, they, it's very easy for doctors to hide behind that sort of, this is the protocol, I've done what I should do. And, and also, I think a lot of doctors are very scared about their colleagues and what, you know, what their peers actually think about what they're doing as well. And if you step out of the normal boundaries of what what is expected of you and you start doing something a little different you you risk the uh, scorn and uh, of of your colleagues and i think this is a major factor in in stopping this innovative process of starting to look at these things um and it's, it's very sad because these off-label drugs are, are very easy to prescribe they are cheap you know we're not looking at anything expensive and so many patients are throwing so much money at these expensive immunotherapy drugs and things, and they expect them to work. And yet they only work in about 15, 20% of patients. And then really only for short term generally before they learn to resist the, uh, the, the treatment. And, you know, it's, it's, again, it's looking at the cocktail of trying to make these things work better. And, and, and patients are just wasting a lot of money and they put all their into yeah and you know they put their hopes into these things and yes they can be useful but you've got to be really careful about how you're doing it what's not known is that a lot of immunotherapies actually cause hyper progression in fact about 20 percent get hyper progression which is as many as get any benefits so you know and the big farmer are not going to be telling people about that um so it's not it's not well known but uh you, you know if i was gonna if i had another cancer and I was offered um, immunotherapy, I would definitely looking at uh, using an old drug called pentoxifilin, which is, um, is for intermittent claudication. So that's when you get shut down of circulation in your legs and you can't walk very far because the circulation is so poor. But pentoxifilin actually helps to make immunotherapies work much better by stopping that autoimmune system. Because Immunotherapies can rev up your immune system so much it starts to cause these um, the autoimmune system to, to go too far and then you get pneumonitis, you get lots of itis uh, infections and things and that causes a breakdown and, and eventually you can lose the fight because it's just gone the other, it's tipped it, tipped the it, immunotherapy. Yeah, because the yeah, away. immunotherapy has been showing some promise but it's starting yeah. to show the same aspects of chemo and radiation. It may work for a time, but then it leads to yeah. other problems, autoimmune conditions. It can cause yeah. internal damage of organs and the list just goes on and on. And again, it's yeah. a bunch of oncologists that are just throwing things, hoping it works. And that's not even being a doctor. That's not even 
Reese being a researcher and, and trying to learn the cancers you're actually treating. You know, I tell a lot of cancer patients, ask the doctor what his success rate is for particular cancers. And once yeah. you know that, you may need to start doing some homework. And I think every cancer patient needs to be doing their own homework, just like you did, and yeah. start taking control of their own therapy. And like you said, yeah. you know, chemotherapy and radiation works on the fast growing cell, but we got to target those other cells that'll just keep this thing growing. So let me ask you this, Jane, what are, what, which growth inhibitors are patients rarely given that they need? Um, well, actually we just said pentoxifilin that actually works on something called transforming growth factor beta. Nobody blocks that. And that's the thing that will help suppress those, um, nas you actually have a bad immune cells going on in, in the cancer. The cancer tumor is actually a mass of not just the cancer cells, but it's got a mass of immune cells around it. And some of those immune cells are actually helping to protect the cancer from being recognized by your own immune system because it's your immune your own immune cells that have converted from normal cancer fighting macrophages to tumor assisting macrophages so they they actually help the cancer to survive by protecting it and this is a, a disaster um so you know you and transforming growth factor beta is one of those things that will actually help to if you block that that will stop the transformation of macrophages to being protective for cancer, to being anti-cancer. And there are some other drugs other than pentoxifilin, which are, are useful for that as well. Cimetidine, which is Tagamet, which is over the counter. I use cimetidine um, in about 2006, 2007, because my immune system, I didn't realize at the time, but I actually have cystic fibrosis, which was only diagnosed uh, last year, just before lockdown. Um, and obviously I've had it all my life, but I couldn't work out my, why I was getting continual infections and chest infection. I kept on thinking, oh God, the cancer's coming back. Um, and there was a, an outbreak of bird flu back in about 2006, seven. And I was looking into ways to boost my immune system. And I started using cimetidine or Tagamet as a way to reverse the uh, my immune system to try and rev it up a little bit. And actually this, uh, you know, it was one of the things that probably has helped me survive longer term because I've helped to switch my um, T1 uh, um, cancer cells rather than the autoimmune kind of side, which was too high. And, um, you know, I, I I wasn't really killing. I didn't have enough cancer killing immune system uh, cells in my in, in my system. So that was that was a way of switching it around. So cimetidine, and there's actually a, a beta blocker called propranolol, which also works very nicely to help switch your immune system back on as well. Um, but you have to be very careful about using those things. You can't just get those things without having it checked by a doctor. You need to have all of these things um, really looked at uh, because if you start taking a cocktail, you've got to make sure they're not going to interact with each other, etc. So, you know, I, I did get a doctor to say, yes, it's fine. You can take all of those together. But I had to go to several doctors to get my cocktail because I didn't think that one doctor would prescribe everything that I wanted. Um, I kind of, I went to my normal oncologist actually for two of them. And back then she was far more willing than I think oncologists would be today. You know, they are far more reluctant to, uh, to do anything different, but thank God I had a brilliant, I had a brilliant oncologist who was quite prepared. She saw how, um, critical my situation was. And she thought, well, I showed her the research and I said, look, there's a very good chance this is going to help my cancer, uh, improve, uh, at least a little bit. Can, can we prescribe and she prescribed the lovastatin and the atodolac which is normally for arthritis and then i got another doctor to describe uh, to prescribe the um dipridamol, another one for the smatidine um and later on the metformin as well. so it, it was a building of of my cocktail <laughs> bit by bit really um but i i did check that they weren't going to interact horribly because they're all low toxicity essentially um, so, you know, the, the chances of them uh, interacting badly was very low. And besides which, I did that at the time without using chemo at the same time. But the point is, these are so low toxicity that you can use them alongside your traditional treatments, chemo, radiotherapy, 
um, so that you can build that cocktail into a very powerful cancer fighting uh, machine. Well, let me ask you this: when all when this when your cocktail started to work, and I'm sure that you went back to the oncologist you know, to have the normal test run, were you shocked and were they shocked to see that your cancer was going away? Oh, oh, totally. I, I was more shocked than anyone, <laughs> to be honest. You know, I uh, it took about seven months for it. So it's not a quick fix, you know, and, and targeting the, the metabolic side, uh, you don't, like chemo and radio, you can see quite fast results with it. But actually, if you're targeting the metabolic side, it does take longer to kick in you can't expect it to sort of work overnight um so uh yeah no i i I, honestly i was delighted my my uh oncologists were delighted you know um and uh but i I didn't reveal everything that i'd been doing back then because i I thought they'd just frown on it so i didn't i didn't say everything um well what what (laughs) yeah no i agree with that i have a i know a lot of patients that will not tell their doctors everything and for yeah. good reason. But which foods did you cut out and how does exercise fit into the equation? Well, I cut out an awful lot of things. So glucose, high glycemic foods in particular. So things that uh, uh, release a lot of glucose. So um, anything too sugary and carbs, you know, high high glycemic carbs were definitely out. Um, I cut out bread, pasta, you know, and um, white potatoes. Sweet potatoes are better. They are actually a lower glycemic load. I used to have a little bit of sweet potato. The skin on the sweet potato contains something called uh, coningic acid, and that helps to block the glycolysis pathway as well. So it's definitely, you know, have your sweet potatoes with their skin on. Um, And I cut out dairy, didn't have alcohol for five years. And um, uh, what else? I mean, I I cut out an awful lot of things. You know, I I lowered my protein intake. Uh, I didn't have so much um, you know, of uh, I did have a little bit of venison and I did have a little bit of duck um, occasionally, a tiny bit of liver every now and then for vitamin A and D. Um, so, yeah, and fish. I kept up with my um, fish, particularly the oily fish. You know, oily fishes can be uh, very useful uh, for providing those omega-3 acids. Very important for um, well, helping let, to find let, Well, Jane, let me ask you this, because earlier you brought up the fact that uh, prostate cancer and you um, melanoma uh, seem yeah. to feed off of fat. Now, the fat that they feed off of is that uh, bad fats and or yeah. omega it's, three. It's not, it's not the omega three. The omega three block the uptake of the bad fat. So it's important that so you raise the intake of those kind of fats in order to block the bad fat from getting in. Um, and there are some ways to actually block the fat. Uh, getting into the cells as well. There's a a very useful supplement called Dan Chen, um, which is like a natural equivalent to the drug I use, Dipridamol, um, which blocks one of the cholesterol pathways. But yeah, so it's a, um, there's a a combination effect of getting the right diet and using the right fats. Um, uh, And I would say omega-3 fats are are way up there in terms of what you should be, you know, and actually quite high doses of uh, omega-3 are, required really in order to try and block the bad fats and saturated fat will actually feed the cancer and help the um, progression of the cancer as well so it travels around in little clumps with the the metastases are these clumps of um, they can travel around in the circulation and seed in new areas and as they travel around the, the system they use clumps of fat and platelets they they they're a little clump that sort of hide themselves from the immune system um and saturated fat is one of the things it hides in so you know it's important to cut down on that when you are uh when you've got cancer most definitely well you know ladies and gentlemen how to starve cancer without starving yourself by jane mcclellan now listen to this there's at least there's 26 chapters in her book and every single chapter is very important If you have gone through cancer, if you are going through cancer, if you know someone going through cancer, you need to read this book. So let me kind of entice you a little bit. There are chapters in Jane's book, such as your cancer starving cocktail, 
how to starve cancer, how to stop dangerous metastasis. That is vitally important. Also, how to reboot your immune system, which in today's time is extremely vital. Also, yeah. how about a chapter that says how to kill cancer? And the list goes on. This is a book that is something that we've needed for years. And to see that all of this information is together. You know, I always tell, tell you on a daily basis, we have to take control of our own health. Doctors don't know everything. Doctors are not prone to want to learn anything new. They get caught up in the system. They just want to show up for work, do the job and leave. They're not looking to cure anything. But guess what? When it comes to cancer, there are cures. Jane has just shown us a little bit that we have to understand that all cancers are not the same. You can't be throwing chemotherapy, radiation, and even immunotherapy at it and expect it to go away. We have to take control. Where is that control? Knowledge is power, ladies and gentlemen. And Jane's book is going to give you more knowledge, more power to take control. And Jane, wow. I mean, there is so much in this book. We could just go on and yeah. on. But for all it, it, of my it can book, be a bit, yeah. bit overwhelming. And, and the, you know, half of my book is really my inspirational story. I thought that I'd start with that because it kind of gives you that background of how I did it. And then um, you get to the science bit sort of in the second part. But, you know, that can be a little bit overwhelming when you're first thrown into cancer. I, I strongly suggest people buy the book, they read it. And then I do have an online course, which has got lots of pretty diagrams. And uh, I break it down section by section, lots of tiny videos going through each point so that you can kind of uh, learn that different process of cancer and how it works. Um, so it's I, I've got over 100 videos actually in my course. So it's, it's taken a long time to put it together, but um, it, it's, it's $97. So it's not hugely expensive. A lot of these cancer courses, I've tried to make it very affordable for, for most people to, to, to be able to just get on there and do it. Um, and it breaks down more specifically which pathways are uh, more active for different cancers. So for example, if you've got colorectal cancer, I'll, I'll talk through which, which pathways are more appropriate to block for that compared to say ovarian cancer or lymphomas or whatever. So um, it, it's breaking down the different um, cancers and trying to make it more specific for people because the book is, is um, it does break down um, a lot of the stuff and, and goes into more specifics as well. But the, the course kind of goes that extra step to, to, to be more specific for you, uh, for your particular type of cancer. And I think that's important because they are different. Um, and then you've got to take into account other things like the mutations as well. But I'll go into that as well. <laughs> yeah. So you so you cover the 18 supplements and you also mentioned that the various types of old school drugs that you used yeah. and why you use them. So the reader is going to understand and learn so much. Literally, it's going to save their life. Yeah, and there are other drugs as well. Uh, Mabendazole, which is an old parasitic, anti-parasitic drug, which in the UK we still give to kids. Very low toxicity. I mean, they're using that very high doses for brain cancers for kids just on its own uh, and getting results. But, you know, that can be added into your cocktail. You can't get it quite so easily in the US, but there is um, a clinic called the Care Oncology Clinic that um, will actually give out statins, uh, metformin, doxycycline, which is an antibiotic, which again has um, quite powerful anti-cancer effects as well as the mebendazole. So there are ways to get these drugs, even if you can't get your normal oncologist on board. You know, there I've, I've got a, a long list of doctors actually on my website, which is howtostarvecancer.com. So if you're struggling, go to my website, have a look and see if you can find a doctor in your area. Most of them will do teleconsults anyway, so you can Zoom with them uh doesn't matter whereabouts you live you know even if you're in a different country they will they will often um teleconsult with you so uh the options are there they're a bit 
overrun because <laughs> my book has been very popular and uh uh they they found that you know the waiting list is getting a bit longer but um have a look and see you know the care oncology can take quite a lot of um patients on board and that you know they're they're very helpful well, and they, they're doing a very similar cocktail to the one i put together so yeah wow jane and and ladies and gentlemen you need to go to howtostarvecancer.com it's on the bottom of your screen buy Jane's book. I know it's available on, on Amazon as well. Uh, you know me, I'm a guy that downloads books on Kindle and read, read, read. This is a book. Even if you don't have cancer, I would suggest you buy the book and just read it from front to back because you're going to gain that knowledge. Look, I'm not saying one day you may get it, but hey, we live in a world where a lot of things just happen and we don't know why. So hey, why not be prepared? Get the arsenal going here. And right now, knowledge is power. And Jane McClellan, wow, you are a wealth of knowledge. And I am so glad that you are a 22-year stage 4 cancer survivor and beating two <laughs> terminal type cancer. That is absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I pinch myself sometimes to understand that I'm still here. You know, uh, I never thought I would be. I, I thought I'd, I'd be lucky to make forty. You know, uh, and won't be on that now. <laughs> ah. So I'm, um, I'm absolutely delighted to still be here and be able to help so many people now. And uh, it, it's, it's a joy to see so many people doing so well. And you know, and and long may that in, increase. And 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 this whole patient revolution, because that's really what it is. I'm trying to get patients to learn about this so that they can they can do this stuff. And then when they get these amazing results, the oncologists go, "Oh wow, what have you been doing?" And then they start to come on board. It's only when they start to see results that oncologists actually start to change their behavior. And and you know this is this is it's happening slowly, slowly. And you know they might not do it with one patient, but once you've got once an oncologist has seen three or four patients doing similar things using off-label drugs or whatever, and they go, "Wow, it really does work," you know, and oh. and that's when we'll start to see the changes. And but it takes about fifteen years minimum for oncologists to change. So we we got to speed this process up somehow. Well, that's the reason why I believe in education, because if a patient, if multiple patients go to an oncologist and start saying, well, you know, the metabolic pathway of this type of cancer is such and such, eventually the oncologist is going to go, somebody's doing research and maybe they need to start doing the exact same research because we need doctors who are absolutely educated that never give up trying yeah. to gain knowledge and trying to understand their yeah. own specialty. And, you know, I, for one, get tired of lazy doctors. And you have a book that I think that will supercharge and energize the, the cancer. Uh, I hate to call it the cancer industry, but they, yes. need, <laughs> they need their eyes opened to some simple yeah. things that have dramatic healing effects and you've proven that and jane just keep doing what you're doing your test became your testimony and has become yep. your mission to help yep. thousands if not millions of people who are dealing with cancer today thank you so much okay i, I really appreciate you having me on the show it's very oh fun. absolutely and ladies and gentlemen again go to howtostarvecancer.com sign up for jane's course start learning buy the book Take it from me. You know, I'm a big proponent about reading and gaining knowledge. So guess what? You've just been told knowledge is power. And in this case, this is something you need to add to your wellness library. How to starve cancer without starving yourself. Again, howtostarvecancer.com. Go there. And uh, again, Jane, thank you so much for your time as you're coming in from London and uh, ladies and gentlemen, stick around because I will be back right after this.